Greetings! This is Dr. Ellen bringing you the fourth video in a series of videos entitled Philippinex Diaspora Decolonization Process. Today we are featuring Dr. Kim Kompok, who is at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, lecturing for the Department of English and Ethnic Studies. Dr. Kim is a member of Decolonial Pinai and Women's Voices Women Speak Hawaii. She's active in building bridges across communities in the demilitarization of Oceania. The title of my talk is uh, Philippinex in Hawaii and Settler Solidarity, the Decolonial Courage of Jose Laborneo. So just a quick outline of my talk. Um, I'm gonna talk about my background and some terms that I'm using today. Um, talk about who is Jose Laborneo and the song Kalana Napua and talk about a little bit why that's important to the Hawaiian sovereignty movement here. And the main question I'm addressing toward the end of my talk is what can Laborneo and this song teach us about decolonial courage in the context of Filipino settler solidarity in Hawaii and Oceania today? So just a little bit about my, my background and positionality. Um, I was actually born in California. I've been in Hawaii since 2002. Uh, my father is uh, Filipino, Visayan specifically, uh, born and raised uh, in Kahuku here on the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, my mother's from Huntsville, Alabama, um, Hawaii military family. So um, I didn't grow up here. I moved to Hawaii as an adult. I've been a graduate student um, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa um, for the last uh, <laughs> seven years until um, recently now I'm, I'm, I'm teaching here. And so the questions of this, of this webinar are very, are very close to my heart. Um, and the work that I do both in and outside the academy, in a lot of ways have been trying to pursue uh, these questions of um, how can we tell a new story of Filipinos in Hawaii um, and diaspora? How can we fight US imperialism? And most of all, how can we win? Um, so I'm, even though I'm an academic, I can sometimes be slow with the new terms. I'm, I'm trying to use the, the term Filipinos I haven't made the big move to Pilipinex yet, but anyway, I, for those of you who are new to this term also, I just want to take a moment to, to be specific. Um, by Pilipinex, I'm, I'm including Filipinos, Filipinas, and individuals outside the gender binary. And so I use it in this talk as an adjective, as a singular noun, and as a plural noun. And uh, for those outside Hawaii, um, I use the term Hawaiian, Kanaka Maoli, Kanaka Oivi, and Oivi interchangeably to refer to native Hawaiian or indigenous Hawaiian. Okay, so um, for this part, I'm gonna be uh, reading a little bit from my dissertation and specifically about Jose Laborneo. So um, now I'll begin. For Filipinos in Hawaii interested in our ancestors' commitment to Hawaiian sovereignty, few stories spark the anti-colonial imagination like the origins of Kalana Napua uh, which is Hawaiian for famous are the flowers or famous are the children. The song was written in February 1893, less than a month after the U.S. overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani. Many sources verify that Eleanor Wright Keiko Ohi Vaikalani Prender Prendergast, the celebrated Hawaiian poet and songwriter, wrote the song at the behest of the Royal Hawaiian Band, who famously approached her saying, quote, we will be loyal to Lili'u, <clears throat> we will not sign the Hawaii's paper, but will be satisfied with all that is left to us, the stones, the mystical food of our native land, unquote. The band requested Prendergast to write the song after the provisional government who had orchestrated the coup demanded they sign an oath of loyalty. All but two refused. Instead, the musicians defected and started their own 40-piece band loyal to the queen. It was in this tumultuous and uncertain time after the 1893 overthrow, but before the annexation in 1898, the Kalana Napua was written. Few people know that this most cherished Hawaiian protest song represents a Filipino Hawaiian collaboration. The Royal Hawaiian Band was then headed by Jose Sabas Laborneo, a prolific composer and saxophonist. While there is some debate over whether Laborneo is the composer or arranger of the song, one thing is certain. Laborneo was a Manila-born citizen of the kingdom who strongly opposed the U.S. takeover. According to Hawaiian ethnomusicologist Amy Kekuu Le Aloha Stillman, Laborneo was a close friend of the royal family and was likely present on the night Prendergast wrote the lyrics. 
I begin my talk with Laborneo's story because his unique life speaks powerfully to questions of decolonization and kuleana, or rights, responsibilities, and authority for contemporary Filipinos in Hawaii in several respects. Laborneo immigrated to Hawaii during the kingdom era and quickly established himself as a musician and conductor. In Hawaii today, sorry for the background noise, uh, we are often given the message that the overthrow was prehistory to our arrival as cicadas or contract laborers in 1906. <clears throat> Excuse me, Laborneo's story contradicts this notion and any notion that we were impartial bystanders to the overthrow. Laborneo staunchly defended the authority of Queen Liliuokalani against the interests of the American businessmen orchestrating the coup. In effect, he became Hawaii's first anti imperialist Filipinix. As leader of the Hawaiian National Band, he worked tirelessly to demonstrate his solidarity through music, both inside and outside Hawaii. He composed at least 10 other royalist compositions and led the efforts to tour the band as an act of protest against the provisional government, traveling from San Francisco, Los Angeles, Kansas City, Denver, and Boston to build support for the Queen. After touring the US, he went to Lima, Peru, where he spent the rest of his life and wrote many still beloved compositions, including Marcha de Banderas, or the March of the Flags, still widely considered Peru's second national anthem. I argue Laborneo's visionary actions in both Hawaii um, and the US, as well as South America, provide much needed role modeling for contemporary Filipinos in settler colonies like Hawaii, Guahan, and elsewhere, as he represents the decolonial courage needed to sing a song of sovereignty wherever our circumstances may take us. Um, <clears throat> the settler colonial critique has opened up important challenges for us as Filipinos in Hawaii and how we tell the story of our communities and the ongoing U.S. occupation affecting the aina or the land upon which we settle. Today the Philippines is a nation of its own, but because of global capitalism and ongoing US imperialism and other problems, 6,000 people leave the Philippines every day. For working class or working poor immigrant Filipinos who are targeted for deportation by the state, targeted for exploitation by capital, US citizenship is a much desired banner of protection. And these ideas of deoccupation and decolonization can seem a hard sell. When given a choice between third world independence and first world occupation, so to speak, many people will choose the latter. National sovereignty is not the same thing as a functioning economy. National sovereignty is not the same thing as freedom or liberation. Given the human rights abuses in the Philippines, both under Duterte and before him as well, Hawaii can seem like a paradise. But of course, when Filipinos in Hawaii say how grateful they are to have come to, quote, America, it really makes things difficult for Kanaka Maui and others trying to build futures that are independent of the United States. So while my comments today are on the optimistic side, I want to acknowledge how big the task in front of us really is. Uh, Filipinos have a proud history of resistance. It is a huge strength to build off of, but we need decolonial courage to act. Um, so coming back now to my, um, to my PowerPoint, I'm just going to speak off of my slides at this point. Um, I'm focusing on, on Le Borneo and this song, and specifically the lessons in decolonial courage that we might glean. Um, so the, the rest of my talk is organized around these three ideas, um, looking at the idea of a loyalty oath. Um, and the fact that Le Borneo refused Americanization and you know, refused his consent to what the provisional government um, was demanding of him and the, Royal, and the, and, and the Hawaiian band. Um, and then I'm looking at his strategic politics, both the uh, deadly serious and deceptively sweet nature of the song itself. And then thinking also in terms of his life, um, moving beyond refusal and singing the song of sovereignty in Hawaii and in the diaspora. So first of all, this idea of a loyalty oath, I think is just really captivating for me. Um, you know, it reminded me of what Japanese Americans went through during, um, uh, during World War II. Um, and just this idea of America demanding, demanding allegiance, um, I guess not exactly analogous, but just that the, the power when America tells you, are you with us or not? And the fact that Laborneo said, no, I'm not. Um, I think uh, we're at a really, um, powerful time right now um, to, to make the argument that Americanization um, is killing us and killing the planet. 
Um, the neoliberal agenda is keeping um, many of us poor and vulnerable and pushed into diaspora. Um, Americanization means endless war, um, beginning, of course, in 1898, um, but then continuing right into the present. Uh, the, the recent nuclear threat to Hawaii and uh, or perceived threat to Hawaii and Guam, um, and of course, global climate catastrophe. All of this is powerful evidence that this this America the Great narrative um, is really nonsense on stilts. Um, and so I think that we must make our refusal public um, in, in the same way that Laborneo did. And we must create opportunities for broad-based movements of, of decolonial Filipinos to refuse Americanization too. Um, so strategic politics. Um, I think this is a good point. I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn now to the song itself. Um, when I say, the song is both deadly serious and deceptively sweet. Um, I'd like you just to hear uh, the melody that we're talking about. Um, give me just a moment as I, as I bring up the song. This is... So um, that's the melody of the song. And now coming back to, um, oh, let me make sure I can do this share screen, PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so <clears throat> the part of the song that gets quoted the most is the third and fourth stanzas, and I'll read this here in English. Um, no one will fix a signature to the paper of the enemy with its sin of annexation and sale of native civil rights. We do not value the government sums of money. We are satisfied with the stones, astonishing food of the land. Um, and um, you can kind of imagine a debate happening, you know, <laughs> at the time when Laborneo wrote the melody for, for this, these powerful lyrics. You know, is this really the right melody for such a protest song? And yet, you know, we see that this is, you know, one of the most celebrated, perhaps, you know, the most celebrated protest song. Um, it's enduring legacy into the contemporary era is you know, really unparalleled. Um, just recently on, on Wednesday, we had the 125th anniversary, uh, excuse me, commemoration of the overthrow and, um, and the song is still being sung. Um, as we can see here with the lyrics, you know, the, there's a clear critique of imperialism, the sin of annexation, or really have, the word is heva in Hawaiian, you know, very serious word. Uh, the critique of capitalism, I think, is really uh, moving. The, the government, we do not value the government sums of money, uh, you know, the seduction that comes with Americanization, modernization, all of these, um, all of these problems that we still deal with. And then at the end, we're satisfied with the stones, astonishing food of the land. You know, they call this the pohaku or stone song. Um, it's not a casual reference. You know, they're talking about sacrifice, uh, living a life that's respectful of the land and grateful for what the land um, can give us. And I, I think that, you know, the questions that that leaves me with is, you know, if you're going to talk about serious topics like this, like ending imperialism, ending capitalism, um, trying to remain steadfast for futures that we really don't know, um, we really don't know what the future is going to look like. Um, how do we do that? How do we make our message irresistible to a broad coalition of people? Um, and how do we write our message in such a way that's contributing to the struggle in a way that Kanakamali will find useful? And um, I think with Kalana Napua, we see that uh, Laborneo figured that out. You know, he wrote this, this song that, you know, if you didn't know the Hawaiian, if you weren't in the know, you, would, you may not realize that this is a protest song. And yet, um, it has it has endured, and we want to make our movements, you know, equally beautiful and equally captivating. Um, and then this last section, beyond refusal, singing a song of sovereignty in Hawaii, um, 
and, and diaspora. I mean, I think it's very provocative to think that, you know, within a month of the overthrow, uh, Labornio was there. Um, when he went to Prendergast, he knew he wanted, he had just a couple of, of lyrics he wanted to share with her. And is, is there a way that we could collaborate? Um, you know, he toured the band here in Hawaii on the Aina where the annexation occurred, then on the continent closer to the centers of imperialist power, educating people on what happened here. And then his money ran out and then he found himself in Peru, you know, maybe um, in a place that maybe had little to no awareness of the Hawaiian struggle. Um, but he used that opportunity, I, I would think, I don't speak Spanish, but I'm, I'm so eager to find out about the, um, the Peruvian archive on Laborneo um, and what might we might discover there about him singing about Hawaiian sovereignty, um, not just in Hawaii, not just in, you know, um, on the continent, but in other places in uh, South America, maybe in the Caribbean as well, so that uh, we, we we're talking about how important this issue is wherever we find ourselves in diaspora. And I think when you look at um, Philippinex, it's, we're you know, about 120 countries around the world. We, are, we definitely are a global diaspora now. And we're, if, we can, if we can align ourselves with indigenous movements in all of those places and anti-capitalist movements in all those places, um, I think that we can tell that new story of um, decolonial Philippinex that uh, um, makes use of that diaspora in, pow in powerful ways. Um, and that builds on our anti-colonial heritage, um, both in the Philippines proper and, and outside of that. Um, so that's all I have for right now. Um, again, uh, mahalo, uh, Ellen, for this opportunity. Um, I welcome comments from everyone. Thank you.